Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Stu Borman of CNE News, and I will be moderating today's event. This webinar on essential polymer characterization, why every polymer chromatography lab will benefit from light scattering for measuring molecular weight and size, and the role of FFF in branching analysis, is being sponsored by Wyatt Technology. CNEN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNEN's audience, consistent with CNEN's mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look at the help widget at the bottom of the screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you are disconnected during the web webcast, please log in again according to the instructions you received earlier. You are encouraged to contribute to the webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. The Q&A session is at the end of the presentation. As your moderator, I will be posing as many of your questions as time permits. CNEN does not endorse any company, products, or services that may be mentioned in the webinars, and each webinar will be archived at CNEN online after the live webcast. As mentioned, today's presentation is being sponsored by Wyatt Technology, a leader in light scattering instrumentation and software for determining the absolute molar mass, size, charge, and interactions of macromolecules and nanoparticles in solution. Wyatt says that its reputation for excellence in innovation and customer support makes the company the global benchmark for quality in analytical instrumentation. Today's speaker is Andrew Meyer, Senior Applications Scientist at Wyatt Technology. Andy Meyer completed his PhD in Applied Science and Polymer Chemistry at the College of William and Mary in Virginia, where he performed life monitoring, mechanical and molecular weight analysis, of nylons and composites used in offshore oil recovery. Dr. Meyer joined Wyatt Technology in 2001 and since that time has served as an application scientist, the dean of Wyatt's Light Scattering University, and the director of customer service and support. Currently, he is a senior applications scientist at Wyatt. Andy, please go ahead. Well, thanks so much, Stu, for the kind introduction. And you know, I'd also like to thank my colleagues and collaborators here in the U.S. Uh, and overseas in France and elsewhere uh, who contributed uh, materials and case studies for this uh, CNE News webinar. Um, you know, the, the presentation here is intended to introduce the viewer to benefits of light scattering and field flow fractionation, uh, as well as viscosity uh, and some other techniques. Uh, for polymer characterization. Now, if you're a, a seasoned veteran uh, viewing here today, um, you know, stay tuned. I've hidden a few nuggets in here for you as well. Um, but we will start off relatively simple and, and get more complex as we go. Uh, but again, nevertheless, this is a, uh, an introductory uh, session in nature. Um, and since the title here on the screen is also a working outline of today's uh, two-part discussion, I'd like to just jump right in and begin with a story. Um, in my travels across North America, much to my surprise, I still very often meet with polymer chemists uh, who are using a single detector uh, calibration-based method for HPLC work. Um, you know, here uh, we see a diagram of a basic GPC system using a refractive index detector after the chromatography column. Um, after injecting a series of standards, uh, like known polystyrenes, uh, we can construct a calibration curve uh, using the apex of each standard peak eluding, um, resulting something like this polynomial fit you see on the bottom left um, of, the, of the slide. Now, this approach has been used for decades, um, and I have to wonder how many of, of, of the viewers here are still using an analysis like this. Um, typically, um, I hear two reasons why folks you know, are still using this antiquated approach. Um, one is for historical reasons. Um, it's the data that reviewers, um, internal or external, want to see because that's what they've always seen. Uh, so they need to continue doing it. 
Um, the other reason, though, that, that I don't know, troubles me a little bit is that it's, it's believed to be justifiable scientifically. Um, that is to say that you know, folks feel that it works fine as long as your analyte is similar enough to the standards um, being used in terms of their elution properties. Uh, or, or in other words, if you calibrate your column with the same materials that you will later measure, you can't go wrong, right? Um, and we weren't quite sure if that was true, so we put it to the test. And here's a simple enough injection of what we were told was a broadly polydispersed uh, 29 kilodalton polystyrene. Um, and we see the RI uh, chromatogram uh, here in blue. And then we have the slice-by-slice -slice, uh, molecular weight results from the column calibration curve uh, that are overlaid. Easy peasy. Um, so now how do we check this work? Um, you know, how else can we measure and verify the molar mass, uh, the molecular weight for this polymer? Well, let's use a multi-angle light scattering detector in line to actually measure molecular weight um, over the entire peak elution uh, to see if it's really 29 kilodaltons and to see if it's truly a broad polydispersed standard. Um, so here in blue, we still have the, uh, the RI trace, and then we also have uh, the molecular weight values uh, based on the column calibration in blue, and then the molecular weight by moles in red. Now notice something very important here. Um, while the blue column calibration points steadily decline over the course of the peak, the light scattering results do not. Um, and, and this difference arises because, you know, first of all, any column calibration routine, you know, the blue data here, necessarily uh, follow the column calibration curve. Anything eluding later off the column must be smaller in molecular weight. Um, but meanwhile, the light scattering detector has no such predestined result. So that gives us the ability to actually measure molecular weight for each part of our polymer without regard for elution time. Okay, we're not beholden to that calibration curve. And so then what does that mean for our numerical results? You know, we can look at the table below and we can see that um, the column calibration may or may not be accurate. And we see a small difference in molar mass here. Um, but more stunning is how column calibration will tend to overestimate the polydispersity, and most especially for something that's a narrow polymer, right? Because again, the regime is beholden to these predetermined volume-based results. There's a built-in polydispersity, if you will. So we're only, what, two slides here into this webinar, and already we've seen how column calibration fails even for a polystyrene on polystyrene calibration system. And again, the, the title of the slide is intended to be a misnomer. It's not a broad standard at all. It's a narrow standard. Um, so why don't we take a minute or two to figure out just how this light scattering detector works to give us directly measured uh, molar mass results. Um, you know, if we look at uh, these, uh, these conceptual diagrams here, and, and again, many of you viewing may already have uh, a working knowledge of how multi-angle light scattering works. Um, we'll move you know, relatively quickly here. Um, if, if you'd like more information about the theory, please visit the, the Wyatt Technology website. Um, in, in any event, what we do is we shine a laser at the mobile phase as it flows through an optical cell, uh, pictured here, and we monitor the light scattering intensity at several fixed angles around the cell. Um, so the schematic on the left and the photo of the actual flow cell uh, on the right. That light scattering intensity uh, that we measure, the value I, is directly proportional to three terms. Uh, the C is relatively easy to grasp, concentration. Um, so we will need a concentration detector also in line. That's usually a refractive index detector. Another term we have here is the DNDC value, uh, the specific refractive index increment. Um, this is essentially the refractive index difference between the polymer and the solvent. Uh, you can find tables of these values in the literature, or you can measure the DNDC with your aforementioned RI detector. Uh, the key here is just to be sure that your refractive index instrument is operating at the same wavelength as your light scattering instrument, right? Because the DNDC value is a wavelength-specific parameter. So we 
want to be sure we have everything matched up properly. Um, anyhow, that leaves us with this uh, big M. Uh, it doesn't stand for magic, but it really is the magic of the light scattering approach. Uh, you know, since we can measure I and C directly with the inline instrumentation, and we can uh, look up the DNDC value or we otherwise know or measure it ahead of time, the molar mass is solved for directly. Now, of course, this is a very simplified expression of the light scattering equation, uh, but it is at the heart of how this technology works. So then that leaves us with the question, why do I need multiple angles? Why is this moles? And the answer is that if the molecule is smaller than 10 nanometers or so, we collect roughly the same amount of light at all angles of scattering. And so this image on the bottom left is intended to convey that the scattering from the molecule is even in all directions in intensity. That's called isotropic scattering. Um, and having multiple angles of measurement in this scenario helps us to gather meaningful statistics and a very precise measurement. But, but for molecules and particles larger than 10 nanometers, the plot thickens. Um, the scattering pattern is uneven, um, as shown in this diagram on the bottom right-hand side, um, at which point we must have data from a wide variety of angles in order to solve for molecular weight. Um, in this case, though, we also have the ability to leverage that information a little bit. In other words, we can measure molecular radius. Uh, since the larger the molecule, the more strongly the scattering manifests in that forward direction. So thanks to the multi-angle design, um, we can quantify this angular fingerprint. We can quantify that angular scattering anisotropy to calculate the molecular radius directly. So it's two independent measurements here, um, molar mass based on the overall light scattering intensity at all angles, and then the radius, which is based on angular variation, all in one shot, not too shabby. And so uh, in this slide, we have a look at the complete uh, SEC MOL system, right? We've added the light scattering detector you can see in front of the refractometer, and we will read data from uh, both of those instruments at the same time. Um, we also have uh, a UV absorbance detector available, and we'll see data from that instrument in, in just a few minutes here. But this uh, arrangement will work with, gosh, just about any solvent, uh, just about any GPC column, typical flow rates and conditions, room temperature, uh, elevated temperature, uh, and so on. Um, we can even take this up to temperatures over 200 degrees Celsius. And here, as an example, we see a, a MALS inter instrument interfaced with a TOSO Ecosec HT system. And uh, thanks to the configurable heated transfer line design, the MALS can be interfaced with just about any uh, high temperature chromatography system. Now, this is true multi-angle light scattering at high temperature uh, with a, an 18 angle instrument in this case. You know, be sure always to, to check the number of active detectors before moving forward with any uh, light scattering system. Uh, you can see in the, in the previous slide that one or two angles just will not get the job done. If we're, especially in this case in the bottom right corner where we have uh, scattering anisotropy, if the, if the angular variation um, is measured with only one or two angles, we simply won't be able to capture that with a one or two angle light scattering instrument. Um, and even in the case of isotropic scattering, uh, as in the bottom left, with only one or two angles of detection, we just don't have the precision uh, that we need for the best possible measurement. So always be sure to check the number of active detectors before moving forward with a, uh, a high temperature uh, or ambient temperature light scattering system. In any event, moving on, we have uh, the, the question of universal calibration, right? At least one or two of you viewing might be thinking, this is all fine and good, but can't we use a viscometer to improve on the column calibration and instead go to a universal calibration regime? Um, maybe all these problems go away. So let's involve a viscometer as well here and see how much it helps. Um, you know, here's an example of a universal 
uh, calibration scenario um, where we, you know, again, we're, we're plotting the change in the product of molar mass times viscosity versus elution volume. And so it's proposed that we can apply this to any random coil polymers, hence the name uh, universal. Um, and we see that, again, we struggle when we compare the universal calibration-derived results with the absolute molar mass results from the malls. I was actually pretty shocked to see this at first. Um, just, again, the, the such large numerical differences um, with the universal calibration. Uh, you know, when you look here at the, at the polydispersity especially, um, just how different it is. Um, I had thought that maybe universal calibration might be able to do better. Um, but note in the next slide here, if we um, look at intrinsic viscosity measured over time, um, the intrinsic viscosity was confirmed to be constant over the peak. You know, this, this makes perfect sense because we know this is a monodisperse uh, polystyrene. It's not the broad standard that we were told that it was. Um, so if we recall that the universal calibration curve is downward sloping, right, uh, with a, a constant viscosity and a downward sloping calibration curve, then it must follow that the molar mass would also decrease over the peak with elution time, right? In other words, if the eta value, the viscosity, is constant, while the product of molar mass times viscosity must decrease as per the calibration curve, then molar mass must decrease. So I'm not sure if the right word here is ouch or oops or what, but either way, it's no good. Um, so we're in a similar situation uh, now, just like we were with the conventional calibration. We really need a direct MALS measurement to make this work. Um, you know, another study we did that was related um, was done where we varied the amount of injected material, okay? So in this overlay, we see in green uh, a four microliter injection of this sample, and you'll recognize this from the previous slides. The blue trace represents an injection of tenfold more sample, okay? So we injected 50 microliters. And at first glance, everything looks fine. Um, and up here in red and maroon, um, we have the malls based molar mass results from each of those two injections, okay? And down lower, we have the results from conventional calibration. And of course, those overlay perfectly for both injections because in both scenarios, we're using the same calibration curve, okay? Um, but what's interesting is that there is a shift. You'll notice that the apex of the 4 microliter peak is to the left of the apex of the 50 microliter peak. And so uh, this is when we start to get into, into deep water with, with column calibration. We can see in the table of the numeric results that the conventional calibration derived molecular weight results have shifted by about 20% as compared with the MALS results, which are pretty well self-consistent despite the different injection amounts, okay? So um, just an, another look at that. Um, we can also try the same uh, approach with the universal calibration, and it probably comes as little surprise that, again, uh, with the universal calibration, we have a significant shift in molar mass. Um, these results are, uh, are not as stable as we would hope. So if you're still doing column calibration or universal calibration work in your lab, please take note. Um, I would encourage you to review some of these effects in your lab and, um, and note that light scattering detection can be a real lifesaver uh, in these situations. You know, moving on, um, what about copolymers? These can be especially tricky because a, a copolymer won't follow the elution profile of either of its uh, constituent monomers. Um, and the copolymer ratio may be variable over the course of the run, right? So um, you may have reasons why we don't actually even expect 
the column calibration uh, regime to work. Um, and just as importantly, there may not be a copolymer standard readily available, uh, or it just might not even exist. Um, so column calibration just might not be possible, um, much less applicable for your copolymers of interest. On to the light scattering world, what we can do is we can exploit the optical properties of the individual monomer units in the copolymer. We can set the wavelength of our UV detector uh, such that one component, maybe a styrene, uh, absorbs while the other component uh, would be UV invisible. So in other words, the UV detector would only be um, detecting one part of our copolymer. And then meanwhile, the light scattering detector and the refractive index detector would be sensitive to both parts of the copolymer. So as long as we know the UV absorptivity of one of the monomers and the DNDC of both monomers, we can solve the entire molecule and calculate total molecular weight along with percent A by mass, percent B by mass, slice by slice, all the way across uh, the chromatographic trace. And so that's just what we've done here. Here we see the chromatogram and the total molecular weight results in red. And I apologize for the error on the left here. Obviously, in red, we're uh, plotting the RI and the light scattering traces, uh, while in black, uh, we have an overlay of the weight percent polystyrene uh, for this polystyrene acry acrylic acid uh, copolymer. That shows a, a changing uh, copolymer ratio with increasing amounts of polystyrene as we move from left to right. Now, these percent polystyrene results were later uh, confirmed by NMR, but my favorite part of this uh, approach is that there's just no extra work involved here, right? You're making a single injection of your uh, unknown copolymer, uh, just as you would normally. You probably would have made that injection anyway to measure molecular weight, um, but thanks to that differential UVRI light scattering data, not only the molar mass, but also the mass percent polystyrene just drops right into your lap. So in summary, um, we have seen the number of benefits that light scattering adds to HPLC detection. It's a primary measurement directly measuring molecular weight uh, rather than relying on a secondary estimate, um, and literally saving the day when there's no such thing as a molecular weight standard for your unknown. So the accuracy um, in these cases, uh, especially for novel polymers and so forth, um, is, is just unbelievable. Um, thanks to that direct measurement, we also have excellent reproducibility, uh, flexibility in our choice of run conditions with you know, little or no concern about shifts in elution time caused by changes in loading and other separation parameters, um, and, and of course, speed. Um, keep in mind here that each injection made on the system would represent real, meaningful data collection uh, of your actual samples. You know, in other words, you won't have delays, you know, cost uh, of time and money, uh, rerunning and rerunning calibration standards. It's a much more efficient mode of operation. All of these reasons are how I got involved in light scattering for polymer characterization in the first place. Um, uh, at the beginning, Stu mentioned, you know, my, my nylon work at the College of William and Mary, and we were studying novel polymers for which there were no standards. Um, there was no way to build a meaningful calibration curve, and the light scattering detector uh, came in and saved the day. This decade, um, a lot of folks I've been talking to um, are moving toward UHPLC. And you might have noticed along the way in the previous slides that the example data traces were all taken from a UHPLC system um, with relatively small elution volume, um, you know, relatively fast run times, just a few minutes, um, just a couple of minutes in, in, in many of these cases. Um, as more and more folks are transitioning toward smaller columns, such as you know, these UHPLC columns, um, run times will continue to run shorter and shorter, which will translate to steeper calibration curves 
with less and less room for error with these elution-based measurements, right? So just a few seconds shift will actually net a huge change, um, a great influence on the molar mass result. And so our flagship 18-angle uh, Don Helios instrument is what was featured in the previous data slide, right? Again, keeping in mind that with the UHP we have uh, UHPLC, we have so little room for error. Uh, we really need a direct way of measuring molecular weight with precision. On to part two, branching analysis and field flow fractionation. Um, you know, many of you know, just like molar mass, the degree of branching is a key structural parameter. Uh, that will have an impact on your bulk polymer, you know, dictating its mechanical properties, uh, its ability to dissolve in solution, rheological behavior, and so on. Um, and so a lot of folks are interested in not only measuring molar mass, but also this uh, branching analysis. We can break down the theory a little bit, a um, little bit of history here. Um, Bruno Zim and Walt Stockmeyer decades ago uh, related the branching ratio G to the number of arms or branches in a polymer molecule. And we calculate this value by relating the radius of our branched polymer, uh, as measured by MALS, uh, to that of a known linear analog with the same molecular weight. And so this paradigm is incredibly uh, powerful and valuable. But let's note that a MALS instrument uh, can only measure radius values um, larger than 10 or 15 nanometers. Okay, so for those of you who are studying larger polymers, you're in business, um, but for the smaller uh, molecules, we lack the ability to measure radius by mole. And so uh, years later, Zim introduced another expression, this G prime, which uses intrinsic viscosity as the measured quantity for the branched and linear polymers. And relating G prime back to G using a correcting term called the draining parameter, this uh, value E. And um, what makes this uh, possible um, is uh, the ability to measure the intrinsic viscosity of these small polymers. That can't be done with the light scattering detector, okay? So the, the, if you look at these ratios G and G prime, the closer these values are to one, the more linear the polymer is, and the smaller and smaller uh, G and G prime values indicate more densely packed, more highly branched polymers in solution. And for more detailed theory and, and mathematics of branching analysis, I would encourage you to view our archived webinar uh, focused on this topic and entitled Branching Revealed. It was given by Dr. Stepan Podzimek and viewable at Wyatt.com. Uh, for now, let's move on to the real data. And here's a relatively straightforward branching analysis just to get us going. Uh, this is a conformation plot for a branched polymer overlaid with a known linear analog. On the left axis, we plot radius against uh, molecular weight down on the ordinate. And it follows that the linear molecule, so shown here in red, um, will be less dense. I don't know, maybe I'll call it fluffy, okay? Uh, and therefore, it would have a steeper slope in this conformation plot. Uh, larger radius value. And meanwhile, the, the branched version would be more dense in solution, uh, yielding a smaller slope and a more compact size. Yeah, and, and a frequent question that I get is, uh, you know, do I have to have data from the linear version of my polymer? Uh, yeah, technically, no, uh, because the Wyatt software does offer the ability to use a linear model for comparison purposes. So we can construct that data uh, from the literature from previously measured values if that's necessary. So no, you don't have to have the linear polymer on hand, but for practical purposes, it's, it's best to run it if that's possible. Okay, and so we can calculate the, uh, the branching ratio based on this data. In any event, um, we, can, we can take everything uh, shown here, all these uh, branching ratios, and uh, based on the linear and branch molecules, we can calculate the G and the G prime, leading us to insightful information, um, such as the number of branch units per molecule that's shown here, um, or the long chain branching index. And since we had a viscometer available for this experiment, we were able to calculate G prime, 
um, which turns out to be similar to G for this particular polymer. Uh, the draining parameter, pretty close to one um, in this example, which is a perfectly reasonable value that would actually allow us to go lower and lower in molar mass um, for the branching analysis as needed. We have an easy case there, but it's not always quite so easy. Um, branch polymers will present uh, some unique challenges in chromatography, and even in, in SEC malls, um, we can run into some, some headaches. Here's an example of SEC malls revealing, I don't know if you'd call it unusual or unexpected, uh, elution of a high molecular weight polymer component. Um, we see a, a similar uptick in the radius results plotted over time, which re would result in this you know, oddly nonlinear conformation plot. You know, we'd love to see this conformation plot in a nice straight line, but I have to wonder if this is real. You know, we see that both the sizing and the branching analysis are, are just dreadfully incomplete because of non-ideality uh, in this separation. How, how does this happen? Um, it turns out that most of the high molecular weight uh, molecules, in, in this case, elute properly, um, but a portion of the molecules become entangled or, or anchored in the gel pores. And so after some time, um, some of these you know, larger molecules that have become delayed um, you know, eventually find their way out, but by that time, the smallest molecules are also eluding, so we have co-elution here uh, at the later time, and we end up with a mixture. Um, so in the end, we are faced with this falsely curving uh, conformation plot, and um, you know, folks faced with this situation rarely, if ever, find suitable gel columns for separation. So an alternative uh, separation mechanism needs to be employed. And, uh, you know, one such uh, alternative is field flow fractionation, which offers a, a wide and programmable separation range. And perhaps most importantly in this case, there's no stationary phase. Um, where, you know, shearing effects and other anchoring effects uh, can take place. And so we see the, the field flow fractionation system pictured here. Um, the separation mechanism in FFF is driven by two factors. Um, first, there's a, I don't know, you might call it a suction, um, a downward force in any case that draws everything uh, toward the bottom of this channel where a semi-permeable membrane uh, keeps the polymer in the channel while letting the mobile phase uh, permeate through. And note in the image here, the largest uh, green-colored molecules are influenced more by the cross-flow and are pushed very, very close to the membrane. But meanwhile, the smaller molecules diffuse around randomly in solution more quickly, and therefore they reside on average a little farther away from the bottom of the channel. You might think of it as a sinking versus a floating effect, um, although that's not, strictly speaking, what's happening. That's maybe an easy way to conceptualize what's going on in any case. Um, and so the slight difference in altitude becomes very, very important because the normal channel flow, which you see um, on the left uh, indicated by the arrows, um, proceeds along the length of a channel in a parabolic flow profile. Okay, so the molecules nearest the membrane are pushed only a little, uh, but those floating a little higher up in the channel are swept out more quickly. Um, and so in the end, we have separation that's based on hydrodynamic size, just like chromatography, but the elution order is reversed. The smaller molecules are eluting first. Um, but again, the key here is that we don't have the entanglement issue, right? This is an open fluid channel. So there really isn't anywhere where the molecules can become stuck in the channel, okay? And we have a quick look at the hardware. Um, you can see the, the, the malls and the refractive index detectors uh, on the top of this instrument stack. Um, and we have a variety of, of HPLC systems uh, that can be used to drive the AF4. Um, you might already own 
uh, suitable, compatible HPLC system um, that could be used for this purpose uh, or shared uh, between GPC duties and AF4 duties. You might already have what you need in your lab to, to do much of this. Um, in any case, um, back to our friend here, we have the SEC separation, which was not so good, um, but then we ran the sample on the AF4 and voila. Uh, we have a nice, clean separation uh, without entanglement, beautiful separation uh, based on hydrodynamic size only. Um, thanks to that really beautiful illusion, we're able to generate uh, in blue here a, a, a meaningful confirmation plot for our polymer, a very reliable, uh, measurable confirmation plot. So in summary, um, we can directly measure uh, the branching ratio, G, by moles, uh, or if necessary for our smaller polymers, we can measure G prime with a combination of a moles instrument and a viscometer. And in cases where branched polymers are eluding improperly from a GPC column because of entanglement, uh, or in, in cases where an orthogonal method is required to verify SEC results, um, field flow fractionation uh, is also a very, very powerful tool. Uh, one more thing. I, I'm no Steve Jobs, but I do have one more thing for you. Um, pictured here, we, we see a wide eclipse uh, AF4 mall system coupled to a thermo mass spec system. Uh, the possibility of this interface you know, opens up FFF uh, for those of you who might need mass spec data and maybe you're looking for an alternative separation platform. So that's something to keep in mind as you move along. Um, I would encourage you for further study to read Dr. Stefan Podzimek's text light scattering, size exclusion, chromatography, and asymmetric field flow fractionation. This text covers much of what I've introduced here uh, in just greater, uh, deeper detail. It's a wonderful text, uh, very well written, uh, comprehensive. Um, online, uh, please visit Wyatt's website for more theory uh, on our polymer and theory pages. Um, thousands of references to peer-reviewed papers in our uh, online bibliography. Uh, and our archived webinars on our webinars page, and so much more. Um, again, thank you so much to our hosts uh, for today. And we should have plenty of time now for questions um, at this point. Okay, Andy, thank you for your presentation. And uh, we do have some questions. Uh, the first is, how do you measure the molecular weights of copolymers as the polymer composition as well as DN slash DC vary with molecular weight? Oh, that's a, a great question. Uh, thank you, Yulu. Um, it, you know, if you look at the elution of a copolymer over the course of the peak, the, the question is saying, you know, if the copolymer composition is varying, that means DNDC varies. How can you hit a moving target and, and accurately measure molecular weight over the course of that elution? The key to that is that in that copolymer analysis, remember we're using two different concentration detectors, right? We're using the UV detector and the RI detector to actually measure the changing polymer composition um, over the course of the elution. And so because we have a measured polymer composition at each moment in time over the course of the peak, we actually calculate a unique DNDC value at each moment during the elution. And that unique DNDC value is then used to calculate molecular weight slice by slice over the course of the elution. So we're measuring the polymer composition at each moment thanks to the differential concentration information, and then we're using that uh, polymer composition to calculate the DNDC and then end up with the molecular weight when we add in the light scattering data. Okay, thank you. If I do not, if I am not interested in the palladium value, I assume that's what PD means. Uh, poly, polydispersity. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, if I am not interested in the 
polydispersity value, do I at all re am I at all required to separate the polymers by column, or a simple MALS in batch experiment should be fine? Oh, good heavens, yes. The, um, the instrument, of course, can be used in the flowing mode um, with the flow cell as shown um, in a previous slide early on. The idea is we also have the ability to remove the flow cell and use a scintillation vial as our measurement vessel. That would give us one molecular weight, right? That would give us the weight average molecular weight, just a single number um, of, any, of everything that's in solution. Um, another way to tackle that would be to just use a sort of a flow inject method. We, we might call it a micro batch method, where you leave the flow cell in place, but just load the flow cell by hand with a syringe or, or with a syringe pump or some sort of injection device. And so it's perfectly fine to load unfractionated polymer solution directly into the instrument. And again, we'll, we'll measure the entire dog's breakfast, right? We'll measure the entire solution and get one average molecular weight for everything in solution. That approach is very, very powerful if you have polymers that for some reason just won't separate well um, in chromatography or in FFS for that matter. Um, or I, I think like the question was asking, if I just don't care about polydispersity and I just want a quick measurement of molecular weight, then the batch mode is very, very helpful for those uh, situations. Okay, thank you. Can you use AF4 for peptide characterization, or would the size of the peptide limit the AF4 effectiveness? Oh, great question. Um, you know, the, the number one concern, if we're talking about very, very small polymers, um, and, and this question is asking about peptides in, in particular, um, basically the, the main concern is that the analyte doesn't fall through that membrane, that supporting semi-permeable membrane at the bottom of the FFF channel. So we just need to make sure that the, the molecule, the hydrodynamic volume, the hydrodynamic size of the molecule is large enough that it will be kept in the channel and not swept out uh, through the, the, that cross flow. Um, as long as the molecule is large enough to be held in the channel, then we should be good to go. What is that limit? Um, you know, we have uh, most of the membranes are established by a molecular weight cutoff based on dextrans. You know, we have uh, the common membranes that are used are 10 kilodalton, 5 kilodalton um, membranes, but smaller are available. Um, we can check with you uh, about your specific sample. Thanks. What about use of FFF with biologics such as virus-like particles? Has there been any success or attempts? I guess biologicals, uh, the questioner asks. Sure, yeah. And so, um, you know, again, uh, well, first of all, yes. <laughs> first of all, VLPs, um, if you go to our bibliography, um, we have a specific uh, field flow fractionation bibliography, and you could search on VLP and you'd see uh, published data uh, involving these types of samples. Um, yes, the, the general size range for FFF, I, I don't know if I mentioned that um, when I was on that slide. Uh, on the lower end, you know, a very, very low number, single digit uh, nanometers in size, um, as I mentioned in the previous question. On the high end, up to a few microns um, in separation and everything in between. So your VLPs might be in the tens or hundreds of nanometers, and those are perfectly well suited for FFF separation. Yes. Okay, um, can there be interaction between polymer and the membrane of F4 or AF4? I'm not sure. That, AF4. Okay, uh, can there be interaction between polymer and the membrane of AF4 that affects separation? Definitely, and that's one of the concerns with, with asymmetric flow, uh, field flow fractionation. We wanna be sure um, that we've optimized the, the solvent and membrane conditions to reduce the likelihood of any um, interaction between the analyte and the membrane. So we, we definitely don't want our polymer to be sticking to the membrane, which would then you know, delay its elution off of the channel, or, or it may never come off the channel if it's stuck to the membrane. And so we have ways of 
of checking that prior to the analysis uh, to be sure that we have a clean elution profile. Do you consider FFF a viable option for separating nanoparticles of different sizes, shapes, and isotropicity? Sure, sure. So that's similar to the question um, earlier about the VLPs. Yes. So uh, nanoparticles, uh, no problem. The the idea is, I think in the question you asked if it was nanoparticles, nanoparticles of different sizes, shapes, um, note that FFF does separate by size, right? So the separation is based on hydrodynamic volume. Um, so if you had, in theory, and I think I saw another question um, that came in during the presentation, if you had two molecules that were the same size but maybe slightly different shape, would they be resolvable? That would be a challenge. I, I, I wouldn't uh, be too optimistic about that because the separation is based on net hydrodynamic size. So as long as we have nanoparticles or polymers of different sizes, they should be uh, relatively straightforward to separate on FFF. Shapes uh, are a different case. We can characterize the shape. So I didn't talk about dynamic light scattering uh, too much or at all during the presentation, um, but dynamic light scattering is another way of measuring hydrodynamic size, of the hydrodynamic radius. Um, remember, we had the angular light scattering for measuring radius as well. With two different measurements of radius, we can do a great job of assessing the shape of the molecule in solution. And so we have uh, folks, and again, you can see this in our application notes in our bibliography, we have folks who have used the FFF to separate these different uh, you know, polymers or nanoparticles and then use the dynamic light scattering RH and the multi-angle light scattering, RG, the ratio of those two radii to assess the actual shape of the molecules that are coming off of the separation. Very, very powerful technique. So um, I don't know if I, I think I answered the question directly and gave you a little extra information there, but um, bottom line is, yes, we can do that. Is there any limitation in terms of solvent compatibility of the two systems, MALS and AF4? Oh, great, great question. So the, the malls, um, the wetted materials are just, you know, stainless steel and glass and uh, a CalRes O-ring. Uh, I, I, I can't think of a scenario where we can't use the malls instrument. Um, it's very robust in virtually any solvent I've ever come across, um, even things like HFIP and, and other very aggressive organic solvents. They're fine with the malls. Um, with the FFF, we're, we're more limited. Um, your common organic solvents, toluene, THF, are no problem. Um, aqueous conditions, you know, alcohols, no problem. But for others, um, just give us a call or send us a note, and, um, and we'll check it out. Is there an application for a heterogeneous population of sizes such as starch? Uh, sure. I've seen, um, you know, SEC MALS data for starches, um, FFF MALS data for starches, certainly batch approaches um, where we don't even use separation. It really depends on the molecular weight. Sometimes you get to those very, very high molecular weight starches, and uh, they just don't behave well um, in any flowing conditions. And so we just revert to a batch analysis, and that works great. You mentioned about peptides. What about huge protein complexes? Is there a way to accurately measure molecular weights for large complexes of proteins and RNAs using MALS or AF4? Oh, sure. Um, the, the key is, is with any of these separation analyses, um, size exclusion chromatography, FFF, if we want to look at these complexes, we just want to be sure that the complexes are stable, right? And so um, we anticipate what a, a tenfold dilution uh, on, on average, you know, with, with size exclusion chromatography, right? There will be some dilution on the column um, in addition to any shearing forces um, that may be incurred, you know, as the, as the samples make their way along the column. So as long as the species are stable and can, you know, survive the separation, um, then certainly we can characterize them as they come out of the column. Uh, similar story with the FFS although 
uh, note that with the field flow fractionation, we don't have the shearing forces, right? So that's one of the advantages of the FFS. There will still be some dilution online, um, but a, a lot less of the, of the physical shearing forces involved. So as long as the species are stable and can survive a little dilution, then, uh, then absolutely, yes, we can characterize them. In, um, in the event that they're not stable, uh, we have other techniques uh, that can be used. Um, again, basically heading to batch techniques, um, and, and you can look at our website. We have different products that are optimized for that particular purpose. Thanks. Uh, how low can you measure uh, on molecular weight, and what level of branching can be measured? You know, we have data on, uh, gosh, what was it, 180 Dalton oligomer um, by MALS. And if you recall that one of the earlier slides in the presentation, the light scattering intensity is proportional to molar mass times concentration. So um, the, the general idea being if we have a very low molar mass species, we'll have to measure at higher and higher concentrations in order for the light scattering signal to be readable, to, to be meaningful. Um, so as, as low as, you know, in the low hundred number of Daltons um, is perfectly measurable by moles. Um, that, would, that work was done in the batch mode. In terms of the branching, um, it, it just depends. I, I'll, I'll have to, to some extent, defer that question because there isn't one direct answer. It depends on the application, the molar mass, the size, and so forth, uh, because we have different amounts of sensitivity depending on the size uh, of, of the molecules. So that's a uh, let's try it out and see type of situation with the branching ratio. Okay, a uh, related question, I guess. What is the highest and lowest copolymer ratio measurable by moles? Oh, good. Great. So, um, you know, note that light scattering is accurate to, you know, at least a, a few percent uh, in terms of accuracy. So then it would follow that for the copolymer ratio, um, you know, if, if you have at least 5% by mass of component A, you know, up to 95%. Um, anywhere in that range, uh, we definitely should be measurable. Um, if, if it's less than 5% by mass of either component, um, that's when we really start to squeeze uh, the technology a little bit, and, uh, and we're, we're pushing the limit. But 5% um, is a safe number. All right, thanks. Suppose you have two highly similar but not identical polymers. Can the conformation plot elucidate the small differences in branching ratio? Um, again, I'd say maybe. We'd have to try it out. It, it just depends on how different they are um, in branching. Uh, it's somewhat related to the previous two questions. You know, again, the accuracy of this technique in general is limited to, you know, a few percent. So um, that translates to, you know, some, some fairly small differences in sizes. I'd, I'd love to try it to see because it would probably work, but I don't want to make any guarantees. If G prime is measured by viscosity, why is a moles instrument needed to measure it? Oh, right. Okay, so so right. The G uh, if, branching ratio is is based on the radius from the moles, but G prime is based on intrinsic viscosity. And so why do we need a MALS instrument for G prime if it's based on viscosity? And the answer is, um, in order to compare uh, intrinsic viscosities, we must be talking about molecules that have the same molar mass. And so we need to use an absolute molar mass technique in order to identify which portions of the data are commensurate for this comparison. So we use the MALS to line up the molecules by molecular weight, absolutely. And then we use the intrinsic viscosity data to actually calculate that G prime value. What are my options for characterizing polymers that cannot be separated by GPC or FFF? Oh, good. So um, generally speaking, um, if chromatography and FFF you know, both will not work, then we'll, we'll generally head toward a batch uh, measurement at that point. Um, and again, I think I mentioned earlier on, you, we can use scintillation vials, uh, very small cuvettes. We have a one microliter cuvette that can be used. Um, and then we have the flow inject or, or micro batch uh, approach using the flow cell 
um, that's what's a 100 microliter or 70 microliter flow cell. So very small volumes are possible as well um, in these different modes. But, but the batch is generally where folks head if the chromatography and the FFF uh, are not suitable. And somewhat related, if considering adding FFF, what are some concerns to be aware of compared to GPC? Um, generally, it's, it's solvent compatibility is the number one issue. We just want to make sure that whatever the, the liquid is um, in which your, your polymer dissolves, that that liquid is compatible with the FFF, and that's simple enough to do. Um, that's, that's generally the number one concern. How can DN slash DC be measured for a polymer? Oh, okay. So if you want to measure that refractive index increment, um, and I, I think I saw another question earlier that said, you know, what is the DNDC? The DNDC is the refractive index difference between the polymer and the solvent, uh, or at least to a first order. And so to measure that value, we can um, mix up different concentrations of our polymer um, in our solvent and infuse them directly into the RI detector. Uh, that's the direct traditional way to measure the DNDC value. That's tedious, maybe a little labor intensive, but it is a direct measurement. Um, we can also measure the DNDC online with a chromatography injection. If you're comfortable knowing that your polymer elutes cleanly from the column, if you inject a known amount of material onto the column and you can expect 100% of that injected polymer to elute in one nice clean peak off of the column, then we can use the inline RI detector to measure DNDC in that scenario as well. That second technique is really nice um, because you don't have to do that tedious uh, series of injections to measure the DNDC. Um, it's just a, a normal chromatography injection, no extra work and you just get a DNDC value at the end. Um, again, you're in that scenario, you are beholden to the assumption that your sample elutes cleanly off the column and is not retained or, uh, you know, other, other chromatography issues aren't happening. Um, but often enough, that's a reasonable assumption, so you can do the DNDC online as well. We've been doing that for years. And how important is low-angle light scattering data for polymer characterization work? It's important. It, the data at all angles are important. Um, the low angle data, the high angle data, you know, the, the light scattering fingerprint of a molecule um, is, is important to assess at all angles. What we see when we actually go into the lab to do this work is that the low angle data, especially at very, very, very low angles, um, is often tainted by uh, particles that are in solution for, you know, various reasons. Um, trouble in the optics, if, if the cell just gets a little, just a tiny bit dirty, uh, that low angle data is easily compromised. And so this is why we need as many angles of measurement as possible, you know, all the way around uh, the, the flowing liquid so that we can get a true measurement of the entire light scattering signature of our molecule. I've heard you can combine one angle, one hyphen angle, light scattering with viscometry to measure molecular weight. How does that technique compared with MALS? Okay, so so one angle with viscosity. I actually <laughs> I wrote a paper about this um, some time ago uh, when I was in graduate school. You know, it's interesting. When you look at these, these regimes like universal calibration, column calibration, um, one angle light scattering with viscometry, they're all uh, model-dependent approaches. Um, it's, it, it, the way I think of this, it's, it's almost like when you go to a, a new town, if you visit a new city, and you learn, you know, how do I get from point A to point B? Okay, well, I, I'll get on the street, turn right, turn left, and then I get there. Um, and, and that works fine until, you know, a, a street is closed or a sidewalk is closed or something, and then, well, how do I get there? I don't know how to get there anymore. Um, and, and all these model-dependent approaches um, are, are point A to point B one route only. Um, whereas the, the multi-angle light scattering gives you the ability to navigate any number of 
molecules, any number of molecular sizes, conformations, uh, solvent conditions, what have you, without having to you know, sort of lock into one mode to you know to one set of coefficients. So I, I guess the, the answer to the question is, you know, like the column calibration and the universal calibration, the the one angle viscometer, uh, one angle light scattering and viscometer approach might work in certain cases, um, but you don't really know. <laughs> That's the problem. You don't really know if it's working or not. Um, and so you use the MALS instrument um, for absolute measurements of these properties, and you you know you have the right answer straight away. Um, so I, hopefully that answers the question. We can get into it more. If, if somebody wants to ask more about that, we can chat about it offline for their specific uh, application. Okay, that's all the time we have for today for the, the webinar. So thank you again, Andy, for your presentation and for your answers to those questions. And thank you, participants, for joining us today. Be sure to check CNN or CNN Online for information on the next edition of CNN Webinars. Thanks to ON24 for technology and production services. And thanks to Wyatt Technology for the sponsorship that made this interactive webcast possible. For CNN Webinars, I'm Stu Borman. Goodbye. <laughs>